All right, welcome everybody again to our faculty Q&A for Residence Academy. Um, welcome everybody here on Zoom that's coming on. I see that there are people coming on one after another. Please put your, your name and where you're coming in from in the chat and say hello. And make sure you have your chat set to everyone rather than just to the hosts and panelists here in Zoom. And welcome everybody on Facebook Live that's coming in now. Um, we are having a, a faculty Q&A on the day that was scheduled to have a live with Nassim for two reasons. Um, during the Mexico trip to Tulum, uh, we had a little bit of a technical snafu, uh, snafu with um, during the Mexico. Oh, I'm hearing myself again. Okay, now I'm not. A uh, little snafu with the technical side of getting it set up. So this is sort of a uh, rescheduling of that faculty Q&A and Nassim uh, wanted to push out his Q&A till next week. So we're going to have live with Nassim next week. And then we're going to have our regular March faculty Q&A the following week. So we have three weeks in a row, in a row for our Q&As with you all. So we're really happy to be here today. And uh, yeah, I see people coming in from Oregon and Champaign, Illinois, Nevada. Yeah, hi from Lindsay and Steve. Brussels, France, Toronto. Yeah, welcome everybody. Welcome also to Jamie and Ines and William, our illustrious faculty <laughs> for the Residence Academy. We've all been uh, involved with this, uh, this work for a long, long time. And of course, William and Ines are part of the research staff. Jamie is our, our Chief Evangelist, shall we say, <laughs> for many, many, many years. And uh, I've been supporting by being on the board of directors and helping to, to build the academy many years ago as well. So uh, always great to be here with everybody. Of course, this is a Q&A session. So for those, let's see, we have about 68 people here on Zoom. And for those of you on Zoom, we're grateful to have you and you can post questions in the Q&A section. And if this is new to you, that, uh, that link is just down at the bottom of the screen where you can hit the Q&A button and put your questions in there for us and, uh, and we'll get, start going through those pretty soon. Um, as always, Jeff Kohlberg has beat everybody to the punch. <laughs> He's always first to post a question. Um, but let's do a quick round of checking in. Um, I can say for my part, uh, I am currently in a beautiful spot in Southern California. Uh, my partner, Razan, and I kind of skipped out of winter from uh, Asheville, North Carolina, which is a beautiful place to be, and it was getting very cold. Um, and so uh, we, we made some good strategic arrangements and hit the road and had a beautiful week in Sedona, and now we're in Southern California at a wonderful friend's home. Looking forward to seeing William, uh, who's just up the road sometime soon. And um, yeah, so, and I, I am very close to having a Spanish version of my book, Cosmometry, uh, ready for publication. So when that comes out, we'll let everybody know. We'd love to, to do a good promo on that and uh, get it out to the Spanish speaking audience. I'm excited about that. So, uh, Jamie, I think you're still in Mexico, is that right? No, you're not. Where are you? Sorry, I'm back in the US now. But Mexico was epic. We just yeah. did, for you guys, uh, if you want a little mini update on Mexico, um, Inez was there. Um, a bunch of the residence staff was there. We had Marco there from Spain, who manages all the Spanish social media. And we had Olivier uh, from France there, who manages all the French social media. and. Um, Nassim presented a lot of new work and new material that he's never presented before. There was about 80 participants and we stayed at a really nice place in the Yucatan Peninsula in between uh, Cancun and Tulum. Uh, and so we had great weather, we had great food and everybody got to like really dial in because we had time to really sit for hours and have Nassim go through his new paper in great detail. And also we talked about ancient civilizations quite a bit. And we had presentations that were excellent from Inez 
who talked, I'll let you talk about what you talked about, but I was impressed with Inez's presentation. I hadn't seen a lot of the material she presented. It included some stuff that was about her life and about Venezuela, and it was really interesting. Um, and the same thing with Dr. Lydia and Arturo, um, two uh, folks, these, these two are, are, are our partners and Dr. Lydia already has a course in the Resonance Academy about the sacred science of ancient temples. And her presentation was fascinating relating to um, the resonance of structures uh, created in the ancient times around the world. It was comprehensive. Um, and then Arturo had a complementary type of presentation relating to space-time architecture as it relates to architecture, architecture around the world. And I'm excited to announce right now that his course, which is currently only in Spanish in the Residence Academy, will come out soon in English. And his presentation was fascinating and also very impressive. So it was a great event. The people that come to these Residence or Nassim events, Nassim has his own company now called Singularity Adventures. So this was a Singularity Adventure uh, trip, not a Residence Science Foundation trip, but they're very you know, complementary and similar in their scope and the way that Nassim presents. But this one was very next level because Nassim's work and his new paper is so next level and he's so excited about it. Um, so he presented it in great detail and I can't speak about the contents of this. We kept it, you know, closed door because the paper is not published yet. And he's hoping to publish that soon, hopefully before the summer. We're not exactly sure when, but this paper is going to be very groundbreaking and the implications of the findings of the paper are huge, you know, from humanity perspective, technology, our understanding of the universe, our understanding of how everything works. Um, so it's an, ex an exciting time in the, even in the arc of Resident Science Foundation and Nassim's work, I've been following it for a long time. He, I've never seen him so excited. Um, and I've never been more encouraged to know that this is coming so soon and that there's a whole bunch of people lining up to help support this work and includes all of you guys. The fact that you're on this call, I don't take that lightly. I consider anybody who's listening to my voice right now to be a very important seed human being on the surface of this planet at this time, um, because you were drawn to this very resonant, very you know cutting edge, next level coherency of understanding what is going on around here. How did we get here? How did all this stuff work? How does the universe work? We understand that it's gonna make all of our lives a lot better, a lot more fun. So maybe I'll pass the baton over here to Inez, just so you can, you know, give your thoughts on that Mexico thing. Maybe just say a little bit about what you presented on, because uh, that was a great presentation. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. Um, so today I'm a kind of like in a, in a transition because I was coming, I was traveling today. So the place I was, I'm arriving from the airport, basically. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm in a cafe at this moment. And so the music you hear behind, it's the cafe music. So <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's how it goes. Um, so I knew what tomorrow right away. away. And it's amazing because Guatemala, this is my family who lives there and my brother's birthday is tomorrow. So I just had to come here and, and visit them. Th two years I haven't seen my family. So and uh, tomorrow is his birthday. So basically, I'm in Guatemala, which is Maya, Maya region as well. So for me, it was very special having to uh, being in Tulum already and being in the Maya, in Cenotes, in all that part, and being in, it's still in the same land, although it's a different country. It's amazing. And um, hopefully, maybe some, some trips soon will be here in Guatemala as well, because they're in incredible sites, Tikal and all of that. And um, so while well, we just had an experience in Mexico, which is like, wow, I, I just, I'm still vibrating from it. It's, it was very powerful, very, very intense. It was, it was like the, the, the question of the, of the group, of the team, it was wonderful. And um, I'm really like missing it already. So the presentations were incredible. Well, Nassim's presentation was like the physics part it was unbelievable. It was like, Jesus, wow. I just can't wait for, to have this paper uh, coming out from him and Olivier because it's like, it's just the next level. And people got so excited. It was like, whoa, so well. The paper, unfortunately, I can still not disclose many, much of it, but it was incredible. Um, then he gave another presentation about, um, well, about uh, bio biology and the Baracas skull and all that was incredible as well. Many details, many, many details about it. Uh, 
which were so so amazing to learn about and um and of course then Lydia's presentation Arturo my presentation which was about consciousness it was quite a challenge but I think I made it through <laughs> because I have some kind of modeling which is um complementary to when the Sims has been working with the double torus but from a perspective of language but you get to the same results basically so for me it was amazing having this um, connection between language and light matter interaction joining the double torus dynamics from Nassim, which is basically relativity and gravity, mass gravity. So that was uh, like a kind of a unification from three points of view, language, uh, light matter interaction, which is, shown with, 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 which is something that happens at quantum scale, let's say. So light matter interaction is quantum in, in, uh, in nature. And then seeing that these two things, which were connected and were basically the same, were connecting as well with and the um, Einstein's fields equation with the double torus dynamics, which is basically space-time bending and um, relativity and mass, created a unification which was, which was really, really powerful. So I was like very glad to, to ha having to convey that message, um, which uh, was uh, quite nice. And everything was just spectacular. I mean, I just cannot, you have to be there to really sense what's going on. Many things happen, it was just magical. So, so then you go back to life <laughs> after such um, building of energy. So you, you go back to life where, but we are like still in the connection still and with the art crystals as well. And when we went to the sites, to the archeological sites, uh, it's just beautiful. And many things happen, like many people receive like some kind of like um, insights, activations. It's quite, it's quite a very, it's quite beautiful. Um, and very honored to be there. I mean, I'm honored to be part of this team. I'm honored to have been have, to have presence that moment, you know, when Nassim is giving these equations and when these people are like, uh, because, you know, our, uh, like the community is so brilliant. It's like an honor having this audience so engaged, so, um, uh, so brilliant. It's just amazing having this kind of like um, mirroring with them. I got so useful insights all the time. It was like every day was having insights from people and it was just incredible. So I'm very thankful for that, very thankful for that. And um, so well, basically, uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> great, great. Thanks, that's, that's, a, that's a great, you can feel the, the update, you know, feel it coming through your update. Yeah, I'm, I'm still yeah. really like, like fascinated. And yeah. I don't know if my volume is okay. Am I speaking? Well, I was going to ask you, it's it's a kind of still competing between background and your voice. So oh, either so you I can, can speak a little bit louder. Yeah, louder or closer. Okay. Or do you have a headset? I don't have it right now. I, okay. I maybe have. Yeah, but I can speak. Yeah, I'm sorry for that. Maybe yeah. if I get closer to the a little microphone. better. Yeah, yeah. If you're closer, that's a little bit okay. Better. Okay, we'll, we'll do that in the future. Okay. I'll, we'll I'll let just, you know if it gets to I'll be too speak louder. I'll yeah, just sure. loud. Okay. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thanks, Ines. No problem. And uh, William, welcome again, as always. Thank you. William Thank you. is uh he's uh as usual in the Torsic. Uh, facility with his white coat on <laughs> we're doing science here <laughs> that's right <laughs> um uh, my uh work desk is actually uh, part of uh one of our labs uh so i'm actually technically in a laboratory right now so this is just kind yeah. of pr proper uh attire uh <laughs> for the lab <laughs> great. Uh, but uh it's great to be here with you all. Uh, great to see you all. Um, I can almost uh, tangibly feel the uh, energy from uh, the Mexico trip. Uh, it's just uh, such a fantastic, uh, it sounds like such a fantastic event. And, you know, I'm just thinking about how it's occurring there at a very specific location, you know, that has very potent uh, geological uh, uh, associations, uh, energetic field associations. So, you know, having a, a gathering of so many uh, brilliant, coherent folks in one place, I'm sure kind of had a impact on the uh, global consciousness. Um, so I think that's always a, a great thing when we have those kind of uh, events. Mm. Um, here, I've been uh, pretty 
busy with uh, some of our biophysics research uh, that uh, we're putting together um, some of our findings that have come from Nassim and uh, Dr. Uh, Olivier Olrial's uh, latest work on uh, um, unified physics, uh, their, their work uh, unifying um, essentially all the constants of nature across scale. Uh, one of the things that's come from this is a really detailed comprehensive understanding of the flow of information, uh, particularly from the fund fundamental most space-time structure. So the Planck scale structure of energetic vacuum fluctuations. Uh, you know, we hear, hear that word like vacuum fluctuations, these energetic fluctuations. And I, I don't know, I, I kind of associate fluctuations with almost like random activity, but uh, what their work has shown is that th these energetic fluctuations of space-time uh, have very coherent phases. So they're actually like crystalline in nature. Uh, the, the mathematics used to describe that is uh, called Bose statistics. Uh, so it's a, a Bose state of matter. And uh, when matter is in a, a Bose state, uh, it, it has very interesting properties and behaviors. Uh, like one of these is uh, called uh, the Bose-Einstein condensate. Uh, essentially where you have a bunch of atoms, let's say, uh, and they're obeying these Bose statistics, these Bose interactions, and they'll have this phase transition where all of a sudden your bunch of separate atoms or particles just coalesce and behave as one large atom. Uh, and so actually, this can be a particle that's macroscopic in size. Uh, but because of the, this extremely uh, or highly coherent behavior, uh, you, you basically can't distinguish individual particles at all. They're, they're behaving as one unitary entity, so to speak. Uh, and so, you know, you, you have this kind of organizational dynamic occurring in, in uh, the fundamental most geometry and uh, energetic dynamics of space. Uh, and that organization uh, is a uh, information pattern and a information dynamic uh, that has very specific results in our physical world, such as when that's occurring, you have what's identifiable as a particle uh, distinguishable from the more random uh, energetic space-time fluctuations, which appear to us as just empty space, even though we can see there's a lot of energy there, a lot of energy. Uh, so uh, with the mathematics, we can now begin to describe that flow of information, so to speak, that flow exchange of information across scale, uh, organizing matter in the universe, and where it becomes particularly interesting, especially to, to myself, is uh, at the scale of the biological organism, uh, where that information exchange and information uh, uh, feedback and feed forward dynamic is organizing matter in such an intricate and complex way uh, that um, it's not just like a, a particle where that same dynamic is, is organizing matter into like a particle. Uh, it's the highly complex, intricate system of the, the biological organism. Uh, and uh, this has a, a huge amount of implications because you can begin to describe how the universe makes this seeming transition from abiotic or non-living matter to the living state. What is that transition? How do you categorize and define that transition? Um, and also how that dynamic is at play, even today, 
you know, several billion years after the event of biogenesis, uh, how it's uh, at play and contributing or, or uh, a, a vital component to health and wellness even. So uh, these are all aspects that uh, we're uh, exploring and, and describing with this, this, these new uh, mathematics and understanding that's uh, come about. Wow, great, that's exciting. That's the, you know, the, the threshold crossover from you know, the extended field into the form and function of biology. And to, to be able to describe that would be obviously quite profound. Yeah. <laughs> exciting uh, that you feel that the, uh, the mathematics is, is, is there or coming through to, uh, to be able to do that. So. Yeah. It, it, and, you know, I, I think that that's what's been missing basically up until now is having those mathematics that we can use mm -hmm. to fully describe this causal link uh, right. the, the, in the, the exchange of information uh, yeah. that, that, that goes from your, your field-like description to that uh, um, entity type description of the, the biological organism. Yes, so, that, that uh, organ, organizing mm -hmm. function. Great. Well, we will certainly look forward to uh, updates. I would like to add, can, can I be heard? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. So this information transfer happening is like kind of a screening of information. So what it's been calculated is the level of screening as you go out of this region of complete coherency. So you have the region of complete coherency, which is what uh, William was describing, the Bose-Einstein. Mm -hmm. And then it starts, let's say, decohering. And that decoherence is a screening of the information transfer. And this screening increases as you get away you know, from, the, from the center of coherence. And um, what's particularly inter interesting is that we have it in mainstream physics, we have it the other all the, like, the all the way around wrong because we think that or entropy is like only half, described only halfway, which is only the part which is going from disorder to order. So we think that everything right. is disorder and we somehow magically go into order from nowhere, you know? Right. So, what, so this theory, what's doing, it's incorporating the other side of the entropy, the order inside, with the, and, the, and so now you understand that there's this entropic um, this uh, negentropic ordering, which would be gravity, that's uh, going into this coherence part. And there's the, the entropic part, which is going from the coherence out into the screening. Mm. So, so that's right. the feedback feed forward uh, also mechanism that's happening. So right. it, it works into gravity and outwards as radi radiation, thermal or, or other types of radiation. So, um, so yeah, so what we're uh, graduating is the screening and the, it could also be called lens staring. It's another way of referring to that screening. And it's basically the viscosity of space-time. How, so how the viscosity of space-time changes as you move away from the center of coherency. Okay, great. That's a great image to have. And you know, I, I would just add to that, that you know, bringing in the, the, the conceptual framework of uh, entropy is highly salient, uh, especially in our biophysics uh, investigation, uh, because you can kind of think of it that life feeds on low entropy states. Uh, and so describing, uh, uh, maybe even defining or categorizing what is the state of matter that we call the living system or life, it has everything to do with uh, thermodynamics and the flow of, of entropy uh, because the living system feeds on low entropy states. Uh, and you know, th there's a number of different ways that it can access those low entropy states, uh, but essentially you know, uh, um, continually tapping into low entropy sources uh, to maintain uh, far from equilibrium thermodynamics. It, and that's kind of a definition of life in uh, a biophysics. 
uh, textbook mm. setting. Mm. <laughs> can I can I try to translate that for people, William? Because uh, yeah. I think what William's saying, if if I do my thing and try to make it into like basic terms, is that there's all this energy in space and biology figures out how to get energy from the quantum vacuum. And then here we are running it, like Nassim likes to say, we're running it almost a hundred degrees for almost a hundred years. And if you calculated the amount of energy it would take to boil or heat water to a hundred degrees, the amount of mass that I have for a hundred years, it's non-trivial amount of energy as Nassim likes to say also, right? Like it's amazing what we're doing right now. Our bodies are unbelievable. And when you get to the micro level of what's actually going on, it's beyond belief what we're doing, right? And we're starting to figure out how neurotransmitters like our neocortex and our cells in general are, are getting energy from the structure of space. It's not just magically that we can do this. There's a physics behind it. And William is on the very front edge, you guys, of figuring this out. There's not many people that are looking at this. People don't write physics papers about consciousness. They don't write physics papers about how DNA is doing what it's doing in relation to the quantum vacuum fluctuations because biologists are like, quantum vacuum fluctuations. I don't know about that stuff. It takes somebody like William to be like, yeah, I know physics and I know biology and I'm going to tell you the link between them. And so this is really important. And Nassim and William are working on a paper on consciousness and man, I can't wait for that to drop because people are going to be like, oh, that's how that works. I've been wondering this my whole life, you know? <laughs> so good work, William. Keep going on. Nice. That. that was a great, great translation there. Yeah. Thank you, Jeremy. A excellent translation. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, let's switch over to some questions. And so I, I will, uh, we, we're all going to choose some questions here. Um, I can begin with one from Jeff. And what we'd like to do is um, for the person that we're answering a question for, we can bring you up on the screen and uh, invite you to, to say hi. And if you uh, prefer not to do that, or you're in a location that's not really convenient for that, you can just leave your camera and your mic off when you type something in the chat, say, I don't want to come on camera today, something like that. Uh, no obligation to do so, but it's a nice option if you want to. Um, also, I just want to remind you guys uh, here on, uh, on Zoom to make sure your chat is set to everyone so that everyone can see most everybody's doing that, but there's a couple of people I saw that's still set to just the hosts. So um, set your chat to everyone. Um, I'm going to just start with a question that Jeff Colbrook put out to me. Of course, I think that can, can be for, for anybody. Of course, we'd like to also just comment on our questions when we have uh, inspiration to do so. Um, and this one, let me just find you, Jeff, and bring you up. Say hi. Um, this question is about the influence of art and specifically the works of Alex and Alison Gray of the Chapel of Sacred Mirrors and psychedelic art in general in uh, the understanding of cosmometry and unified science. Um, here comes Jeff. Hey, Jeff. Welcome again, brother. So, yeah, I, um, I've had the great pleasure when I was living up in uh, the Northeast in Connecticut for a bunch of years to be not too far from that place called the Chapel of Sacred Mirrors or Cosm, which is a wonderful facility that Alex and Alice and Gray, who are uh, premier visionary artists, um, put together a number of years ago. Um, it's this actually has a church status now, so it's it's uh, I think the the maybe the only church maybe there's others that are have a church status. Um, based upon honoring a spiritual path devoted to art and creativity and the, the, uh, the role of the artist to be in some ways, as I know Alex and Allison like to say it, uh, like explorers who can go out and into altered states, sometimes through psychedelics or meditation or breathwork, whatever it might be, and get an insight or a vision and take that insight and vision and translate it into an expression for others to see it. And in their medium, it's through art. And uh, it's extremely masterful. If you're not familiar with COSM, it's uh, cosm.org, it's their website. And um, 
and they're they're building an, an amazing, uh, almost finished building, an amazing. Um, you could call it an art gallery. It's it's one of their temple spaces, really. It's called Entheon, and uh, it's going to house their original art and especially Alex's Sacred Mirrors um, series, which uh, that is already uh, that room is already complete and the, the paintings are in it. So I haven't seen them yet. I'm excited about that. Um, and so uh, I've spent a good amount of time at Cosm and uh, became friends with Alex and Allison and have had great conversations with them about, um, you know, just the relationship between the art and the science. And obviously, I, I always love what Buckminster Fuller said that we're all artist scientists. You know, we all have qualities of intuitive, creative, um, you know, non-linear processes of expression and exploration that then are complementary with our are more rational, linear um, ways, intellectual ways of defining and, and um, coming to understanding of those insights. And, uh, and so, it, and, and really, I, I really admire um, Alex's breadth of knowledge and his interest in science and his interest in traditions of all sorts around the world. And he's quite a scholar in many things, as well as being a magnificent artist. Um, so for me, I, I've got, I've always gained great inspiration and insight from the works of them and others like that. And then most importantly, I just would say the, the, the greatest artist and teacher is found in nature. Uh, you know, the, the way nature creates patterns, combines colors, reveals the underlying energy dynamics, whether it's in water flows or patterns in sand or the bark of trees and flowers and geometries and, or the processes that we can come to understand. And that's extended into the unified physics. And, you know, the, I think is being revealed in the, the upcoming paper, most especially this harmonic ratio relationship that is defining the, the scale um, manifestations, uh, which are, are correlated to musical harmonic ratios. And um, so it really is all one creative and um, artist, artistic and scientific uh, pursuit. So uh, yeah, I, I, Jeff, I don't know if that answers your question in a specific way that you're looking for, but uh, I, I have found great in inspiration and great insight by um, being with people like Alex and Allison and others in that field. How about for yourself? Well, I, it changes the level of my meditations immensely when you see, and of course, his understanding of the fractal nature of the human body and his, his artwork is, uh, gives you an own, a deeper sense of what, what we're in, I think, you know, so, and here we are with William, which I'm going to be listening to his statements many times before I'd be able to totally get it. Thank you, William. But, um, yeah, uh, uh I think that to, to experience, I mean, the artist will bring the experience of unified physics to visual, just like the cosmometry. I mean, mm -hmm. I, if, if people are having struggling with the form, the, um, all the formalization, if they want to dig deeper into the nature of uh, unified physics, the visuals from cosmometry are fantastic. And I sure, I just wondered the connection because it's very artistic in a way. Mm -hmm. and how that beautifully connected with your experience uh, uh, either uh, with that. And even if you haven't done psychedelics, you feel psychedelic when you see there are some of the art out there and I love it. So mm -hmm. that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I, I, I just loved asking that question because I just love I knew you would have a great answer for, for <laughs> us all. Good. Thank you. I just want to throw in there that for those of you who are interested in Al, uh, Alex and Allison's artwork, and you're also interested in Nassim Haramein, those guys know each other. They actually did a tour together called the, uh, what's it called? It was in 2015. It was called the Modern Knowledge Tour. So if you do a search on YouTube for Modern Knowledge Tour, Nassim Haramein and Alex Gray, you might actually get to see some videos with Al, uh, Al, uh, Alex Gray and Nassim talking to each other, um, mm -hmm. just in context. So Marshall knows... Alex, I know Alex and Allison. I've produced events 
music related events in Colorado and had them come paint on stage and stuff like this. And I've done presentations with them on stage. And so they're, they're great uh, friends of Resonance Science Foundation and of Nassim's work. And Alex obviously is painting, visualizing some of the stuff that Nassim is describing in his mathematics, specifically the dual torus field and the energy surrounding the human body. And Alex is really interested in biology and has done dissections of human bodies just to be able to research how to paint the inside of a human body. Um, so those guys are profound. I just wanted to throw that out there for the people that are really interested in this topic to search Modern Knowledge Tour 2015. Great, right. Jamie. I didn't know that. I'm looking forward to that. I do have some stuff placed uh, uh, from the um, after school program where they interviewed uh, uh, Alex. That's beautiful. A a at Love Evolution is the solution. So <laughs> Love Evolution is the solution. And <laughs> I did have something there people could visualize as well. Well, I'm going to check that out. I'm looking for I didn't know that. So thank you, Jamie, for that information. Well, maybe I'll look for it right now. And quickly, uh, Jeff, to your question around, can the art crystal using the emergence of modalities of groups using crystal clear intentions for healing, like Wing McTaggart Circle of Eight, be used to enhance the power and connection in the field? I think you already know the answer to that, Jeff. <laughs> well, I'm starting to do that more and more, and I, I and, I, and we're doing it in healing groups, and um, um, I, I, I just want to encourage i think we have a credible tool here that we we can explore yeah in, in groups uh and that fact i just put in the link my friend lisa denton who's a mystic and a near-death experience and i are wanting to form um a little uh, group that can explore this and as a group a little deeper about the power of the art crystal and how we can use it to empower our intentions for uh, better you know for healing us and the world I think it's great. And, you know, I, I just, without being just flippant in my answer, because <laughs> I know you do have insights into it. And at the same time, there is an exploration there. And, you know, the art crystal as a device that, that can, uh, that does um, enhance a coherent state in the biological system and in the biophysical, uh, you know, the bioplasmic system, biofield. Um, will play a role in as, it, as that coherence is increased individually and in a group. So, uh, yeah, I think that's very true. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Take good care. Thank you and blessings. It's wonderful to be with you guys. You're amazing. Everybody here and this whole thing is just incredible that we're doing this. It just blows me away every time. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. All right, uh, somebody have a question they want to jump into? Maybe the next question, uh, which is from um, Richard Harenberg. Harenberg? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't know if he wants to jump in into the call. I can bring him up. <laughs> you want to go ahead and go ahead and uh, start? addressing that one yeah so the question is how is the double torus related to the isotropic vector matrix i um i remember um okay so i remember that when you have the vector equilibrium uh like um like book mr fuller has uh with all this uh, sites uh, flexible. I don't know if you have seen this video. There's a video from Nassim very, very um, uh, long time ago in which you can, um, I know it was Bug Mr. Fuller, sorry. And he would have the double, the, the vector equilibrium. Uh, so he would compress it and he would expand it. Hi, Richard. Hello. Uh, hello. <laughs> Okay, so so then basically the vector equilibrium, it's got um, it's got uh, when when you see it, it it it, it looks like like a static um, geom geometry, right? But in reality, it's always compressing and decompressing. It's like doing, and when it does that, when you push it a little bit, when you distort a little bit um, its forces, like you make it, um, you put some force in some direction, then it would 
collapse and then contract and decontract and contract and decontract. Can you see the image? Have you seen the video I'm talking about? Maybe. Oh, no. Uh... There's a video from, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm correct, right? It was Bug Mr. Bug Fuller. Mr. Fuller, yeah. And, and there have been others who have de demonstrated what he called the jitterbug yeah. motion, this pulsating yeah. okay. dynamic. Okay. Yeah. I've, I've seen that, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's a pulsating dynamics, exactly. Yeah. So that was, it, it, it collapses down to a, a octahedron. Is that yeah. The, yeah? It does, and it goes through an icosahedron and octahedron symmetry phases as well. Oh. Yeah. 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 And that becomes a double torus. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead, Marshall. Uh, so, yeah. So, when you have a dynamic oscillation occurring, um in in space at any scale uh you it it, it will innately the, the double torus is a dynamic movement of what is when you ask about the isotropic vector matrix and for those who don't know what that is that is a an extended field of of vectors that are all of equal length and all at 60 degree um coordinate system from the center based on the vector equilibrium which is all 60 degree coordinate system uh, tetrahedral octahedral array and so that that is looks to be like a very set static geometric like behind richard's image there is uh, a version of what that might look like and um and yet at the same time it's a dynamic process of oscillation that's occurring so it's it's not just a static that's that geometry is like a reference to understanding what equal equilibrium looks like geometrically um and yet the whole thing is pulsating and as it pulsates it creates a double torus because of the dynamics of the polarization occurring in that pulsation and so uh, there's a relationship. It's always helpful, I find, to for clarification about the vector equilibrium and the isotropic vector matrix as there as those particular geometries. Um, they are representing, as Bucky Fuller called it, the the zero phase, meaning that's the geometry of nothingness, of no motion no rotation, no size, no temperature, none of that. It's a reference point of zero. And on either side of zero, you have the pulsation occurring. And when you have the pulsation occurring, then you get a torus and you get a double torus. That's the relationship. Mm -hmm. So again, just to reiterate, it's important to think of the IVM, the isotropic vector matrix and the VE vector equilibrium as simply the zero phase. Everything else is dynamic. What would the frequency be of that pulsation? Every frequency you can imagine. Uh, now, at, the, at the Planck scale, it's the Planck time. And then you go up the electromagnetic spectrum or down it in frequency, frequency and larger wavelengths and all that. So every pulsation is it's the same dynamic at every scale. And that's why it's it's a quantized system at, throughout the entire cosmic um, spectrum, and it's innately then fractal and harmonic because of the fact that it's quantized because of the nature of resonance that is informing where it comes into uh, form and formation at every scale. Um, underlying all of that at every scale is the same isotropic vector matrix zero point geometry so there's you know that is ubiquitous to all of it but then you get the specialized cases of the manifesting of of an oscillation or a frequency at different scales that manifests you know different cosmic or you know um, cosmological and quantum scale objects and events yeah now that's the same as the 64 tetrahedron grid. It is uh, very much related. Um, the the isotropic vector matrix that Buckminster Fuller describes is a is is a simplified. You could say it's a it's one level simpler 
than the 64 tetrahedron matrix in that it's, it's composed of tetrahedron and octahedron alternating through the whole matrix. And what Nassim was looking for was a balance of tetrahedrons only. And so um, the way I look at it is you can take <clears throat> a, a vector equilibrium, which I, don't, I thought there was a model right near me, but there isn't, um, which is composed of eight tetrahedron that are all pointing into the same center point. <clears throat> That makes a vector equilibrium. I mean, yeah, vector equilibrium or cube octahedron geometry. And if you polarize each of those tetrahedra with their dual tetrahedra pointing in the other direction, radiating outward. So you have all of them pointing into the center gravitationally, and then you polarize those and have them radiating out as star tetrahedron. You have eight star tetrahedron then. That makes 64 smaller tetrahedron in the 64 tetrahedron grid. So you could think of the 64 tetrahedron grid as a polarized version of the Bucky Fuller version of the IBM. Mm -hmm. I think I got it. Cool. Great. And that's and that's the same as the ether or the field or yes. the uh, vacuum. <laughs> that's correct. That's the geometry. That's the geometry exactly. That's the underlying geometry, you know, that zero point field, because it's, it's zero point, because when it approaches no fluctuation, that's the geometry that it's approaching. And of course, it, it never actually fully arrives there. If it did, then there would be nothing visible, nothing detectable, et cetera. Um, and that, that it may describe, help to understand why certain attributes of the cosmos are not visible because they're you know first first of all they're at a scale we can't necessarily detect yet and secondly they may be so close to that equilibrium state that the fluctuations are uh, so minimal that's that we're not detecting them as well fantastic great uh, uh, oh yeah. now you're, you're on a roll here uh, <laughs> when you have all the frequencies i view that as chaos and I view the order as the still point. So it's moving back and forth between chaos, total chaos and total order. And back again. Well, um, yeah, so e equilibrium is both dynamic and you might think of the the isotropic vector matrix model is absolute equilibrium. As Bucky Fuller said, you're never gonna see that in nature because nature is always fluctuating in order to have anything manifest. And yet in nature, we have equilibrium also. And so there's dynamic equilibrium that is you know, hot and cold coming into the balance of a, in, a, in a room, uh, creates a, an equilibrium state, a homeostatic state. And um, so uh, it's essentially the same phenomenon in a dynamic, like a torus is, a, is an equilibrium of dynamic, like you would call it uh, uh, order. Whereas when the torus, you know, a smoke ring just starts to dissolve and fade away, we might think of that as chaos. It's actually just a transformation into other equilibrium states. It's just dissolving from one scale of coherent equilibrium, dynamic coherent equilibrium into other distributions of that equilibrium. So it's always in that, constantly in that interplay. And so, you know, when we think about chaos and randomness, it's, all, it's always got, has to be relative to uh, our frame of reference because there is, pretty much i think always an organization going on that is not chaotic and random but is uh transformative and being in informed by other levels of coherence and equilibrium that may not be apparent to us <clears throat> but are at play so uh can i say that there's equilibrium be between chaos and order uh yeah, th there's a constant relationship. That's uh -huh. right. And equilibrium is <clears throat> the is the 
direction that is always being sought, you could say. Mm -hmm. And so when I go like this and I move the air, there's, you could say there's turbulence and we might call it chaos. And yet immediately that's begun, it's in the process of equalizing and coming into equilibrium again with the whole air around. And so there's a constant relationship between equilibrium and disequilibrium with a tendency towards equilibrium unless something comes in to disturb it again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah, you. Uh, thank you. Too. Enormous implications in terms of my understanding. It's Great. going to take me a while to figure that all out. Yes. You know, it, it's a uh, it can seem complex, and, and I think the key to all of this, like throughout the whole of the unified physics, is to think in a simpler way where it's actually, it's actually one phenomenon, one dynamic, and you could just think of it as the interplay between equilibrium and disequilibrium, and just let your mind muse on that for a while. <laughs> Thank you again for being here. Oh, one more quick one. Uh, yeah. the st structure moves in octaves, apparently. And uh, uh, somewhere I've just, I've seen that described as uh, the basic structure may be 64 tetrahedrons, and then another structure similar but one octave higher. Yeah, it's the the isotropic vector matrix field um, and and the 64 tetrahedron matrix has a has an octave scaling or a, a doubling and halving ratio relationship throughout the whole thing, as does music. This is why they're one and the same thing, which is what I write about in my book. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the reason it is uh, we, we observe harmonic frequency ratio relationships scaling in octaves is because that's the geometric structure of resonance that is foundational to the entire space time field. Uh, that is the geometry of it. And it does innately scale in octaves. That's correct. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> OK, you're, you're welcome. Thanks, Richard, for being here. Take care. You too. OK, what do we have next? So uh, there's a couple questions about what uh, we were discussing at the opening uh, in terms of the biophysics with uh, energy or information exchanges uh, from the field into the biological system. There's actually a couple of questions on that. Um, so I don't know which one of the questionnaires we should bring on, uh, and, and Thompson, uh, asked specifically uh, in mm -hmm. the work that we're doing on uh, neurotransmitters and the neocortex drawing energy from the quantum vacuum, have we identified a location in the brain where that exchange happens most? Uh, then there's also a question um, if we can relate that further to uh, the idea of the body electric. Um, mm -hmm. and so actually, um, it, th those are very highly uh, related uh, uh, questions uh, that the answer is uniform uh, for them both. Um, well, and who's, who's the other person? Uh, which question is that? Uh, that was uh, Maria. Marshall, Maria. Ma maybe we could do a, a first of bringing two people on at the That's same time doing, and yeah. making this kind of a group discussion. I just had yeah. that hit. I'm just doing that too. Yeah, nice. Okay. Yeah, we were telepophoning away we there. Are, we are in resonance. Uh, thank you for the, the question, and Thompson. Um, I don't see Maria just as only Maria. Uh, maybe if you're here, Maria, still, you could raise your hand in the, in the Zoom so I can find you. There you are. You just showed up. Okay, great. Oh, it just disappeared again. Um, okay, if I can get Maria up, I will, but go ahead. Hi, Anne. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for letting me interact with you guys. I'm just really thrilled. Yeah. Marshall, your book, Cosmology, is really incredible. And I've, I've been in publications all my life, and I can tell you it is so beautifully done. I mean, there's like 
editor by day career, and there was no nothing to find fault with. It was perfect in every way. Oh, that means a lot to hear that. Thank you. Yeah, so it's much. fabulous. It's just fabulous. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm also a, a Reiki practitioner and teacher, and um, I am just really curious about the biophysics of this, um, Dr. Brown. If you could. Have you found anywhere in particular in the human brain that you see this exchange happening more powerfully? Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, one of the first things though to point out, just that I, I think it's a, an important conception that we begin to foster, is just that the uh, activity, information processing capabilities that we generally attribute to the brain as a mm -hmm. whole uh, is present in a, a single neuron, <laughs> you know? So um, it's like uh, when the conventional uh, neuro neurobiologists are, are uh, describing the brain in, in terms of uh, the neurocomputational model, the neuron often gets reduced to a very oversimplistic model of a, a, a a single bit mm -hmm. and it's either a zero or one on or off either it's firing an electrical potential or it's not uh and that just couldn't be more erroneous um it, it does have elements of that kind of simplistic computational binary computational activity uh but um the neuron i i believe before long, and with some of the mathematics we have available now, we'll be able to show that, uh, that it, in terms of like bits or even qubits, the information encoding capacity of a single neuron is probably what today is currently attributed to the brain. I think it's about uh, 10 to the 14th bits. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I just, I, I point that out because uh, these, energy exchange is energy dynamic, uh, particularly the uh, uh, coupling and accession of uh, energy slash information from the field, uh, the, the quantum vacuum, uh, it's occurring within every neuron and also the associated uh, uh, micro, microglial cells, which are very uh, important as well. Um, and, and there, we have identified a very specific location where this energy information exchange is occurring uh, with the, the uh, uh, highest uh, degree, and that is uh, the mitochondria. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the mitochondria are kind of like a microcosm of the brain. I mean, in fact, uh, if you look at the inner membrane of the mitochondria, it's highly infolded, mm -hmm. just like the, the, the morphology of the neocortex with the sulky and gyro. Uh, so, so, I mean, from myself, whenever I start to see these kind of structural similarities, it's always kind of an indication to me because, uh, you know, structure, uh, uh, function oftentimes recapitulates form uh, mm -hmm. structure. Um, and so... Uh, actually, a lot of our biophysics research, even in terms of uh, the brain activity, is looking specifically at mitochondria uh, in, in the dynamics at play there. Um, and, uh, you, you know, it, it just even more telling when you look at a single neuron in the brain, um, if you look at the synapse, that, that main nexus of information transmission, uh, one striking thing, uh, it, it, it was striking to me when I first started to look at electron micrograph images of neurons, uh, is that the synapse is packed full of mitochondria. Oh, that's uh, so cool. You know, so, that is so cool. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and then, of course, the, the mitochondria are, are intricately Unexpected. associated with uh, microtubules. And so there, there's this whole um, uh, information exchange uh, that, that you can delineate uh, in the exchange of, of information from the quantum vacuum, the environment, um, through the plasma membrane of the neuron, the mitochondria, storing that in microtubules. 
Uh, so, you know, that, that's, but that, that's uh, that, that definitely down in the, the cellular and uh, molecular level. But, um, you, you know, uh, the, the, but in terms of the body electric, which was uh, Marie's question here, it, it's, um, th this is where Maria that- has joined us too, just- Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is where that, that aspect is perhaps uh, most germane it, because uh, one of the, well, perhaps the way that the mitochondria uh, and by extension our neurons and then our brain are coupling with the quantum vacuum is via um, electrical potentials. Uh, the the um, flow of uh, electrical energy. And uh, this, this is actually a really interesting aspect of the flow of electrical currents. Uh, so within uh, the mitochondria, it, uh, the subcellular organelle, you have flow of electrical currents, um, particularly uh, you've got the, the high energy electron transport chain in the inner membrane, and also the flow of protons from the intermembrane space uh, across the intermembrane into the uh, mitochondrial matrix. This is a flow of electrical current. Now, one of the things is that uh, when you have uh, a flow of uh, electrical current, the energy, and in the case of the biological system, the, the energy that is uh, or ordering and organizing things, so the, the information, um, th that is being transferred via the electromagnetic field. Um, so uh, th there's a physicist, uh, Richard Feynman, who uh, describes how, you know, when we talk about uh, current flowing, uh, in, in this case, it could be like in a wire or in the membrane of a mitochondria or the membrane of a neuron, when you have uh, current flowing, the energy is not in that current. It's not being carried in that current. The energy, and this is what the conventional physics describes. This is what the Maxwell equations, the Faraday laws describe. Uh, the energy, and hence in the biological context, the information is coming from the field. Um, and so it's actually, uh, if you look at the, the vector uh, component, of the flow of current, uh, the vector component is the field, and that is all of space, <laughs> and, and quite literally, like the entire universe. The vector component is the universe coming in uh, a, 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 to, via the electromagnetic field, uh, and, and that's where you're getting the energy. And, and the current is. Um, just uh, uh, setting up the, 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 the electrical and magnetic components that allow for the transfer of that vector component, which is the energy and information. Um, but this is maybe a little bit easier to describe with uh, some of the, 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 the diagrams to actually see uh, um, exactly how this dynamic works schematically. Uh, but uh, just, I guess, essentially what I'm saying is that that current, that flow of uh, uh, the uh, electrons uh, in the mitochondria uh, or the, the electrochemical potential of the neuronal membrane, that current flow uh, is directly accessing the field. And that's where the energy and information is coming in from. Uh, so that's why you see so much energy being devoted from the cellular system, from the mitochondria to generating electrical potentials. Uh, so the, the electrical potentials is, is one of the, the ways that uh, the biological system, the living organism couples to the energy and information of the quantum vacuum. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why um, you have so much uh, electrical, electrochemical activity in the brain um, is that that is how it's coupling to the field. And so actually the, the function of the brain, how it's working is a spatio-temporal affair of the field, not neurocomputational bits going from one to zero. 
Yeah, and, and actually I would have one other question um, to follow up on that is I understand from the HeartMath Institute's research that the electromagnetic field of the heart is like 60 times larger than the brain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And of yeah. course, it, the heart has its own neuronal system as well. So I would assume that those neurons, those synapses there have a huge amount of mit mitochondria. Yeah, well, and, and you know, that's just su such a- Intuiting information. Yeah, that, that's such an excellent point because we have a very brain-centered mm -hmm. paradigm of intelligence. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's not just the brain. The, the brain is kind of a highly specialized system for, for very linear-based uh, logical type behaviors. Uh, but the intelligence of the organism is the entire body. Uh, because all through our body, you have electrical currents, constitutive electrical currents, uh, constitutive um, coherent lasing, that's uh, photons being exchanged, um, uh, as well as like solitons uh, or, or uh, acoustic me mechanical uh, uh, currents, so to speak, or oscillations uh, be, be going through the body in piezoelectric type mm -hmm. dynamics. Uh, so, uh, I mean, the, the intelligence of the organism and of ourselves uh, is involving to a large degree uh, the heart, the skeletal mus muscular system, where, uh, as you correctly suggested, th there is an extremely high number of mitochondria. Um, uh, so, so some of the most di dynamic and active mitochondria are in the uh, cardiac and skeletal, skeletal mus muscular uh, system. Um, yeah, so that, that's just uh, highly pertinent. Um, and, you know, it just the, the, the intelligence uh, goes all the way down to a single cell. Um, and so kind of in a way, we're comprised of 60 trillion, 100 trillion, somewhere in there, uh, autonomously hyper-intelligent systems, uh, you know, wow. and, and the, the kind of uh, just all synergetic interaction of all of those is our intelligence, uh, the human intelligence. So um, actually the, the full capabilities of the, the human system that, that just all of hyper intelligent autonomous entities is uh, pretty phenomenal. And you know, uh, but before we end it, I, I just want to uh, uh, address because I, I, you know you you're, you're a Reiki pr practitioner, so I think that uh, actually uh, having identified a, a location in the brain, not just every single cell in the brain, but a, a singular location in the brain where this kind of activity is occurring more so than in other areas. Um, you can see that uh, particularly um, that's accessible through what is the, the third eye chakra point. Mm -hmm. um, just that you, you have very specific physiological correlates uh, to that location. That's where uh, the uh, rostral migratory stream uh, connects to the pineal gland, the limbic system. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, you, you've got um, the uh, olfactory bulb that's uh, right around in that location. So you can actually stimulate it via pranic breathing. Uh, mm -hmm. But you, you have uh, the, the olfactory bulb with what's called a rostral migratory stream uh, that connects it to the limbic system uh, where you have uh, the lateral ventricles, uh, the pineal gland sits kind of at the control center of the system. Uh, and um, because of the, the function of the, the lateral ventricles uh, and the pineal gland and choroid plexus, uh, this is a site of very strong coupling and energy exchange uh, with the quantum vacuum. Uh, so, so, I mean, some really interesting things are occurring in this specific location, like uh, almost all the new neurons in the brain form in this region. Um, and about 70% of them, uh, they form uh, in the ventricular system. They go along that rostral migratory stream to the olfactory bulb. Um, but 
you, you know, that's where you have most of your neurogenesis occurring. Uh, and because of the strong coupling to the quantum vacuum and the energy dynamics there, uh, there's a lot of interesting things uh, taking place. Um, like the, like the, the genomic recombination of the neurons are occurring. Uh, so yeah. they, you get genetic mosaicism. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's it, it goes on and on. I mean, it's just it's it's really fascinating. William, I love it when you say words I've never heard before. <laughs> Genetic mosaicism. Uh huh. I, I mean, love that. I, I get it. That's a great concept. Whoa, that's pretty. Yeah. Well, well, you know, it's just that some of your neurons, uh, if we were to do whole genome sequencing of them, that that they wouldn't match other cells in your body. Uh, oh, wow. You know, um, a geneticist wow. might say this is a different person. Wow. Um, what? Yeah. I, how is that possible? How does that work, William? That <laughs> is actually a really exciting area of research because, um, you know, we're, we're describing it using quantum mechanical pathways, uh, basically where the genome and it's uh, the, the associated editing machinery uh, is able to form it is forming, uh, you could think of it as quantum superpositions with the environment. And so it's, it's um, accessing information in that way from our environment and directly editing the genome of these neuronal cells, these neuronal stem cells via that information. So it's like in a superposition with the environment, the information, you could think of it collapses the wave function, which leads to editing the, the, the genome. So it, it'll literally snip out a, a piece of the genome, move it to a new location. Now, when it does that, uh, you know, th there's, there's heterochromatin and euchromatin. So say it snips out a region that's usually silenced or dormant. Hmm. It moves it to euchromatin and now it's active and expressed. So you can even like activate dormant or latent genes maybe genes that haven't been active for like millions of years, thousands of years. Um, and so uh, it's, it's remodeling, rearranging the genome based on the information that's coming in. Um, and then you get this neuron with a completely new genome and it goes out into the brain and sets up shop, so it starts making connections with your other neurons. Now, uh, that has been shown that, uh, like, for instance, in the hippocampus, that is essential for the formation of new memories. So when you don't have the, these neurons yeah. that are rearranging their genome uh, and then going into the hippocampus, uh, so like in mice models, they're unable to form new memories. Um, so it, it, it's, a, it's a really fascinating way in which we're taking in information from our daily experiences, encoding it into the genome <laughs> uh, uh, and, and rearranging uh, gen uh, the genome of some of our stem cells. Um, and, and that's part of the, the process of forming new memories. <laughs> Amazing stuff. Very much. Really appreciate wow. it. Hey, Maria, you want to come and say hello? Hi, everyone. So good to be here and chat with you all. Such a pleasure. Where, where are um, you now? Uh, so I'm currently in Greece. I'm from Australia, so currently li um, living in Greece. Uh, just a little bit of background. The reason why I asked the question was um, I was very unwell, and then I started doing... Um, uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza's meditations. I uh, ended up healing from that. And then last October, I attended an event. And after the event, my meditations, my body just shakes all of, And I was just, and when you mentioned um, drawing energy from the field, that's where I asked my question. And the latest thing that we're looking at is body electric. So that's where my question came from. So I guess you've answered my question with yeah, yeah. so you pretty know much yeah, so one of the ways that you can enhance that function of the body uh, yeah to draw energy and yeah uh organizational information from the field 
uh, is by boosting its capacity uh, to conduct these electrical signals to, to set up these electrical potentials. Uh, and so that can um, oftentimes involve, uh, or a good way to do that, I should say, is with uh, what you know we call electrolytes. Uh, you know, oh, so uh, okay. drinking mineralized water. So you know, water with uh, chloride and magnesium because uh, chloride and magnesium, uh, as well as some other um, cations, uh, cationic elements, um, are central to uh, the formation of the, these um, uh, electrical potentials in the body and even the water. Uh, so, you know, uh, that's why actually drinking lots of water uh, can facilitate your ability to, to draw energy from the field uh, because right. <laughs> uh, let's all take a, a sip of water <laughs> 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 while we're on the subject, but no, uh, so, so in the mitochondria, um, it's forming this proton gradient. Um, and so, you know, this is involving trillions and trillions of free protons that the mitochondria needs to have available. Most of those protons come from the water, from water we drink, uh, because um, mm -hmm. water will freely give up protons because it's, uh, especially in its, its liquid crystalline state, in the cellular system, um, the protons are essentially delocalized. Uh, so, you know, this is one of the reasons why uh, drinking high quality mineralized water and in large amounts um, can be just, just that simple thing can be a huge boost uh, yeah. to, to health because one of the things that you're doing is um, boosting your cellular capacity to form these uh, electrical potentials. And um, there's also things like B vitamins uh, that the, um, one of the reasons those are so great for boosting energy is because those are directly involved in the high energy electron transport chain of the mitochondria. Uh, so if you're giving yourself lots and lots of B vitamins, uh, you're supercharging you're superconducting high energy electron transport chain in the mitochondria. Oh, uh, wow. And uh, so th that, that, that's one of the things I, I like to do when I feel a little bit of low energy states coming on, um, drink lots of water, uh, B vitamins and mineralize. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's, great. That makes a lot of sense because mm -hmm. um, over the last month, because um, yeah, once this energy right, in my meditations, once the energy um, has started now a few months, um, so my body shakes quite a lot. Um, and I've noticed the last month or so, I just feel um, exhausted, but I'm not exhausted in the where I can go to the gym and do a complete workout and nothing, you know, I'm not emotionally exhausted. I just feel exhausted. I don't know. Maybe it's the heart because I, I, I'm also in the healing, the Dr. Joe healing group. So maybe it's like the heart center. I, I don't know how to. Do, do you um, do, do you get a, a good amount of magnesium uh, from your diet or even a, a supplement with magnesium? I'm not sure. You know, I, I, would, I would be curious if uh, increasing your dietary magnesium or better okay. yet, get, get in a magnesium supplement because you know describing like the, the shaking uh so th th that is uh a hyper excitatory uh neuronal activity uh neural musculature activity and uh one of the things that magnesium does is it's it's an inhibitor of that hyper excitatory activity um so okay. you know it, it's great for relaxation and sleep um, and, you know, it's just that that is probably it's consuming a tremendous amount of energy uh, because it's, it's kind of, you know, those uh, electrical currents, those electrical potentials, it's generating them excessively. Um, that could be what, what's uh, uh, occurring. And it's just that, um, you know, there's pretty much only 
good things that can happen from uh, supplementing a little bit of magnesium. It's, it's just, it's such a, a vital uh, mineral uh, uh, supplement nutrient. Will, will so is this, uh, is sorry, this for when yeah. the energy, yeah. Yeah, because I think that with uh, magnesium, you can combine it as well with acetylcysteine, NAC. Mm. And the combination of two together, they're very powerful. Yeah, yeah, because uh, yeah, NAC helps to regenerate uh, glutathione. Yeah, it's a, it's a, a, like nutrition for the cell. It's really good. So I would, I would suggest using both uh, together. Yeah. I, okay. I, I'm sorry, I have to leave. I have to cut the my se my session. At oh, okay, yes. <laughs> But <laughs> Thank, thanks for at least being present today. We didn't get to hear yeah, much from you, but yeah. uh, we're I would happy you're here. I'd love to address the electron. Maybe in another uh, call, we can address it. Okay, There's we'll do that. Coming after about the electron. So thank you very okay. much, everyone. Nez, All right. Nez will be have back in two back. weeks. We're doing yes. another yeah. Q&A in two weeks. So. Yes. Yeah, so we'll be back and we'll see it. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. 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 Uh, just another quick thing as well. So now in my meditations, when the energy shakes me quite a lot, it's like I'm being electrocuted. Um, do I just surrender to that and then uptake um, my water intake, magnesium and so on? Yeah, yeah. Because, um, you know, building up like resistance can cause like almost like a, a nervous type reaction in the body. So it's like... Um, bringing a okay. uh, uh, focus and attention uh to, to where that um stressor is building up um i, I think would, would be a, a really great mind body connection to establish um, may, maybe even more importantly than you know dietary uh, uh like um you know bringing in more minerals uh, into the body that, um yeah yeah because um you know, th those uh, kind of uh, psychoenergetic interactions uh, can be actually more powerful than even, um, you know, like uh, hyper excitatory uh, activity due to low magnesium levels, uh, for instance, you know. Um, so so that, that's why, like, uh, I, I definitely, for myself, like to kind of release into it uh, like a, a stressor like that um and uh you know kind of see um where the energy might not be flowing uh as coherently as unabetted as it could um and then um you know cer certainly um you know drinking lots of water and getting uh things like magnesium and, and even um and as had mentioned uh uh in acetyl uh, cysteine, which um, uh, you know that that helps with um, antioxidants, uh, endogenous antioxidant production. Um, that that's another thing that can actually be a cause of this hyper excitatory, almost body nervousness activity, um, is that uh, in the mitochondria and in uh, neuronal uh, electrical transmission, if you have an excess of the generation of um, oxygen-free radicals. Um, th these are hyper excitatory modulatory uh, molecules. Uh, so, um, you, you know, uh, a really good thing for that uh, is green tea uh, because green tea has uh, L-theanine and EGCG uh, and EGCG has direct interactions with the mitochondria. Um, but uh, like, and L-theanine is, is a, a, a neuromodulatory amino acid that again, these things uh, can help to um, lower oxygen-free radicals and lower uh, hyper-excitatory uh, activity. And, you know, if it's not a dietary source that, that's, that is causing it, it doesn't hurt <laughs> to calm the body down because then maybe, you know, when you're doing your meditation, you can more clearly identify, you, you know, where that kind of nervous energy is coming from. There's some and good comments in the, in the chat, Maria, when, when you review I'll the chat. I'll have a look. Yeah. yeah. 
because some people are offering some good uh, reflections as well. So we'll and you mentioned earlier a diagram um, showing the energy flow from the field into the body. Yeah. Is it possible to? Um, yeah. So uh, there's these really fantastic um, diagrams that uh, I, I would first recommend uh, checking out um, what's called uh, the, the, the Feynman lectures. Um, I, I know on one of the Life with My Seams, uh, we put uh, a link to that, to those. Um, I wonder if I could pull it up uh, really quick uh, because uh, it, it's basically um, Dr. Feynman in one of his lectures is describing how, uh, let, let me see, I think, yeah, I, I can actually, I can put a link to it in the chat. I have it here. Uh, Do, Dr. Feynman is describing Maxwell's electromagnetism model, right? And uh, how to most physicists and even lay people, it sounds just crazy. The conventional standard model, because what it clearly describes mathematically and shows uh, is that when you have electrical currents that are moving, um, and you know, so this is the body, the body electric, the electrical currents that are moving in the body are obviously our uh, electronic equipment. Uh, the, the electrical current is not what is carrying the energy. Um, so you can see these uh, schematics, these diagrams, where, and this is called like the, the, the Faraday law. And so I, I might've even been unconsciously kind of doing this with my hands uh, earlier. Uh, and it's basically just that uh, where, say you have an electrical current that's moving with this vector, uh, that'll generate a magnetic field perpendicular and orthogonal to all of those, there will be a vector uh, potential. Um, now, and this, the vector potential, that is energy, kinetic energy, like movement. That's the ability to do work. Mm -hmm. That's what drives the fan when you plug it into the wall socket, is the vector potential, not the current, not the magnetic field. Those allow, those set up so that the field can move energy into where you're directing it. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, and so, you know, it, it's, it's actually that the energy is being transported via the electromagnetic field, not the electro, electrical current. So even in our body, uh, the energy is coming into the body, even when like we eat food. When we eat food, we access the chemical bonds. And what that really means is we start moving around electrons and protons. Uh, that, that's the chemical bonds where we're freeing high energy electrons and, and protons uh, and to make an electrical potential, to, to generate an electrical current. Um, and what our body is doing, what our electrical components are doing is uh, using that to access the electromagnetic field to direct energy into very specific locations. Uh, and so, um, in our forthcoming paper that me and Nassim are working on right now, we'll have the diagrams for how this is occurring in the mitochondria, the cell, the body. Uh, but for now, uh, probably the best place to see it is with the Feynman lectures. Um, I'll, I'll put, post that in the chat right now, Feynman lectures. Um, and, you know, but you, you can see Dr. Feynman, he's like, the way he describes it, he's like, we have this crazy theory that says that energy is coming from the field, <laughs> you know, and it's like, uh, and, and, you know, uh, in, in quantum field theory, if you map out the flow of that energy, it goes out to the entire universe and then comes into your computer <laughs> yeah. or, or in the, the case of like your, your cell, your mitochondria, uh, it, it goes out into the entire universe and the energy goes in to make mm -hmm. an ATP molecule. 
you know, mm. so it's like, um, so that's one of the reasons why, you know, he kind of has this colorful language to describe it as like a crazy unhinged <laughs> uh, theory, <laughs> you know, um, it, because, uh, you know, that's just like, I don't know how long Nostrum has been saying this, you know, they, you know, like the, the, the energy is coming from the field, you know, the field is what we need to be looking at, but uh, there's just this kind of inclination to want to look at, you know, the, the, like the, the electrical current flowing in the wire or the, the particle itself. Mm and it's ch associated charge, uh, you know, when it's really the field dynamic that mm -hmm. um, even the conventional um, 150 year old theory describes as, as uh, a field energetic dynamic phenomena. Sounds like before uh, the, the terminology of feedback feed forward became a way of describing that uh, in maybe in simpler terms, yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, that's great conversation. Thank you both for being here with us today and asking good questions. And William, of Thank course, for so digging deep into it. And did, did, that, so did that help you also, Anne, on your question of like um, the location? Yeah, in the, in yeah the very much. Thank okay. you. That was very cool. Excellent. Okay. All right. Be well. Take good care. Yeah, if I would have known that um, Inez was jumping off a little earlier, I, I would have I mean, maybe, yeah. I had her take a few questions before we got, got into that. But, uh, I uh, didn't know her. I, I guess she, she'll, she'll be back with us in a couple in a of couple weeks. In a couple of weeks. So, It'll be all good. We'll be fine. Fo folks can get their Inez fix in a couple of weeks. So. Well, we're an hour and a half in. Do we want to, to, to call it there for the day? Do uh, you want to get back to some of what you're doing there, William? Or... or yeah, does that feel good? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I could uh, close out, make my closing statement by uh, addressing one of the questions here uh, from uh, in the chat. Just um, what do you suppose it's like inside of a black hole? Because uh, I, I could just real quick mention that well, we're in a black hole right now. <laughs> you know, I was going to tackle that one a little oh, bit. Oh, you, you're going to get it through, Jim? Okay. Yeah, so, uh, you know, um, so, yeah, inside a black hole, um, if you're imagining what it might be like, um, a lot like this. Uh, <laughs> Step outside. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah I, like to, I like to remind people, like, you look up into the sky at night, we know that there's trillions and trillions of stars. Why isn't it just super bright? All it those stars are, are all yeah. shining at us at the same time. The answer is that the light cannot escape uh, the black hole that we live inside. So we're inside the event horizon of a black hole we call the universe. Yeah. And that's why the sky is black. And it seems so logical to say that kind of makes sense, right? The light goes and then it curves and it curves and it goes right back and you, you know, it can't escape. So we're inside of a black hole and the sims theory basically says that there's nothing but other black holes inside of that black hole and they're smaller and smaller from the gigantic super clusters to the clusters to the galaxies to the stars inside the galaxies and then each one of these things are black holes so stars are black holes galaxies have a supermassive black hole in the center and the stars are making smaller black holes that come shearing off the event horizon they're called atoms and so the atoms the protons in the atoms are also black holes um this was very, very revolutionary when the sim first started saying this, people were not having it at all. And now there's like all this evidence and data being collected that starts to back up what he was saying. And he sounds way less crazy. He sounds ahead of his time, which he is. And, and also, you know, uh, the question was, um, you know, maybe the outside of black holes um, aren't really black. Yeah, that they're bright. If you're on the outside of the event horizon, it's like, whoa, that's bright. Oh, it's called the sun. Yeah, the sun yeah. is our so, local black hole. So, so, some of the brightest objects in the universe are black holes, are yeah. quasars, active yeah. galactic nuclei. Those are black holes, mm -hmm. and they're 13 billion roughly light years away, and they shine as bright as a star in our galaxy. I mean, these wow. are the black holes are some of the brightest objects 
they are the brightest objects in the universe. They're black holes that are surrounded by plasma and they have a life cycle just like biology does. And then astronomers give it this name when a star dies and it drives Nassim insane. Like the star's not dying, it's shedding its plasma. And then, oh, there's the black hole. And the astro uh, astrophysics community is sometimes saying, oh, the thing collapses and it creates a black hole. And it's like, no, Nassim's like, no, the black hole was there the whole time. You just couldn't see it because it was very bright and it was surrounded by plasma that eventually it sheds. Um, that which again, makes so much sense. <laughs> And, you know, uh, actually, I was reading some papers from like the 1920s when they were first starting to kind of start to describe the nuclear situation at the center of stars. And uh, the description was essentially um, like a neutron star or a black hole. Uh, so, so actually, uh, they, they were back then on the right track, but then kind of diverged off from that. So, I mean, uh, you, you know, it's... Um, I think ju just a matter of time before, you know, Nassim's model of understanding that, you know, the center of every star is a black hole or even a neutron star, that's going to come to light. It seems like that's indicative of physics in general, that in the early, early days of certain studies, they would get right onto it. Yeah. And then they would find something that's slightly contradictory or it sounds too magical to them. And they're like, no, no, that can't be it. So that happened with the ether, right? Yeah. They had the ether, which is also known as the plenum, the zero point field, the, 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 the vacuum space, you know, whatever you want to call it. And then they said, oh no, th there can't be an infinite amount of energy in there. We have to like round that off. So they rounded off infinity by doing this renormalization thing. And then all of a sudden they're mysteriously missing 95% of the mass of the universe. It's like, maybe you guys rounded off the infinite vacuum energy there back in the day mm -hmm. because you didn't like the ether. And then Einstein was famously said like, my whole thing doesn't work unless there's an ether. You need the energy of the source field or else all this stuff doesn't work. And so that's where Nassim comes in and he's like, here's the math for that. Here's where I'm bringing the ether back. Like they had it and you guys like cut it out. And now I'm bringing it back in again. And you know, I think it's probably safe to say it, that now it's back. Uh, I mean, it's yeah. like uh, the, the, through like the work of Nassim, uh, but uh, I mean, even um, uh, Frank Wilczek, a Nobel Prize a physicist, um, he has the lecture, if you haven't seen it, check it out, uh, the, the materiality of the vacuum, where, I mean, in that lecture at, I think it's at Arizona State University, he says on stage, we are children of the ether. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, talk about going full he claims it. Yeah. <laughs> the most respected theoretical physicist alive today, talking in a way that a spiritual ascended master would talk. Yeah. And it's because those guys knew, but they didn't have the language of physics. Mm -hmm. And this yeah, happens to, also in the world of ancient civilizations and ancient technology and the pyramids, is that all these ancient descriptions of things were right on, but they didn't have modern physics. So it sounds all like out there, but no, they had the fundamentals correct. And so this is where Nassim and others are like very strong in saying, here's the math. Here's what they said back in the day. Notice that the math matches what they said. It's pretty tight. It's tight logic because it's math and geometry. And you really have a hard time arguing with geometry, right? I mean, Marshall is the expert at that, right? Check out cosmometry. Oh, I don't try to argue with it at all. <laughs> no, do not <laughs> argue with geometry. It's not going to work out. Uh, yeah, they, excellent. You know, they had that understanding. And then you, you can see the megalithic structures they built. Uh, so the application of that understanding right. is visible even today. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. Well, we are coming around full circle on that, uh, that which when you see it is obvious. And when you remove it and struggle without it, uh, we get, uh, you know, past hundred and something years of <laughs> some very convoluted abstract theories that... <laughs> I couldn't understand for sure, but you know, when you really have uh, this coherent, cohesive, unified model, um, as as Nassim always likes to say, it's foundationally very simple. And when you when you can see that simplicity underlying it, just constantly think of it as one thing going on. This this one field that is manifesting in all these different with all these different characteristics and qualities, and yet it's all the same dynamic process that simplicity then starts to get your mind to, to, to think in ways that, um, you know, just makes it easier to understand it, I find, so.
All right. Well, let's leave it at that, that for today. Thanks, William, Jamie. And Thanks, Marshall. Ness for being here today and everybody for being here today. As always, all your great questions. I love watching the chat. I'm so glad you guys enjoy it so much here on Zoom and uh, for all you on Facebook, thank you again for being here. Share this please out widely so that others can, um, can get a sense of what these conversations are about and most importantly, the implications that they, they you know, that what we're talking about here has for the transformation and the, the shift of our times. Uh, this is foundational to the success of that shift. We all confidently feel so. Um, have a great week. We will be back next Wednesday with Nassim for Live with Nassim. And then the following Wednesday again at this time for another faculty Q&A. So bring back some of the questions that we didn't get to and we'll see you all then. Take good care in the meantime.